that, you get what's called a pre-production sample. When all the components come into the factory, just to make sure, we make another sample. We compare it to the confirmation sample. Okay, let's say the suede came in and it was, you know, too light or too dark. We want to check it, all those components. We make a sample, and again, we submit it to our customer. It protects us and it protects them. What do you think? Maybe it is a little dark, maybe they'll accept it. Maybe if not, then we've got to go back to the drawing board. That's why we need the 90 days. Then what we get is a, a TOP. Anybody? Pop of production sample. The first shoe that comes off that conveyor line, I want to see. And if it's wrong, we're going to fix it. We compare the TOP to what? The pre-production sample, right? And then we compare the pre-production sample to the confirmation sample. So it's a link. We're comparing everything along the way to make sure that what our customers bought, they're going to get. Okay? Because we don't want any problems. We don't want any claims. We want to make sure. I'm sorry I couldn't have an overhead projector or something, or you don't see this. But the interesting thing about the critical path is that as soon as the order is placed on 915, all these dates are put in here. The C sample has to be here by 105. The P swatch has to be here by 1030. The uh, pre-pro has to be here by 11.15. The TOP has to be here by 12.5. And it coordinates with a production report. Okay? So if you start to fall, be and then underneath we have a section for actual dates. If you start to fall behind that path, if you go off the path, you're in trouble. You'll never ship on time. So again, I want to make sure that C sample comes by 10.5. If that confirmation sample comes 10.10, I'm going to be five days late in December. Okay? If that pre-production sample doesn't come in 15, 20 days before, and it comes after the date, I'm going to be late. Or if the pre-production sample, even worse, comes in late, and they start making the shoes, and we don't check to make sure it's good, I could be making the wrong shoes. Again, being subject to a claim, customer unhappy, that kind of thing. So please look at the critical path. It's very important. It coordinates, it coordinates with the production. Um, once we make the shoes, there's two ways of doing videos. I call it landed and first cost. Okay? Landed means that Fortune Footwear will buy the shoes from the factory. The shoes cost $20 from the factory. Right? I put up a letter of credit. L6. Anybody know what that is? International people. Anybody know what it is? It's a document that my bank sends over to my factory's bank. It's a letter that says that I'm good for that $100,000. Once you make the shoes, the factory would pay the $100,000. The factory uses that letter of credit to go to their bank, borrow from their bank, so they can buy the components to finance the deal. It's a very, very important instrument in international business, the letter of credit. I put up the letter of credit for $20, $25. Let's say it's $20. Hopefully it's $20, not $25, right? And uh, then we import it. We make the shoes, we import it. Then we have to pay acquisition costs. Anybody know what acquisition costs are? Anybody want to give an example of an acquisition cost? Acquisition costs are what it costs us to acquire the goods. How about ocean freight? How about duty to U.S. Customs? How about brokerage charges to bring it in? The logistical process of getting those goods to our customer are our acquisition costs. So as you can see from these cost sheets, what we do is we have a quick fancy that I'll point it out to you. We have the first cost, the factory cost. Then we have the freight, the duty, the customs. But what it ends up costing us, let's say maybe it costs us 30 to acquire it, then we sell it for 40, Hence our 25% margin on our And again, these are actual cost sheets for Victoria's Secret or HSN. So if you have family for any family for Victoria's Secret or HSN, don't tell them my markups. <laughs> That's a secret. I, I cry. Oh, I don't make any money from you guys, but that shows how we calculate the price, what the estimates are, and then it comes in after. So that's called landed business. Fortune Four actually takes possession of the goods, we hold them, and then we deliver them to the customer according to the contract. Another quick way we do business is called first cost. That's where we act as an agent. So basically, Victoria's Secret.
would buy the goods from the factory directly. They put up the LC. I don't put up any money. I just act as the liaison, the agent, like a sports agent. Like he's going to work, you know, to get a contract signed for now. I just get a cut of that deal. I develop the product. Like I have done before, we produce the product. I don't touch the goods. Once they get to Hong Kong, the customer takes them. They pay the freight and the duty. So that gives me unlimited ability to do business because I don't have to finance it. I don't have to go to Mr. Banker and, you know, Mr. Banker always wants to know what's going on, what you're making. You know, they're very, very cautious, especially you say for money. So, you know, you have to run a tight ship and make sure that, you know, you're doing the right thing so the bank will continue to lend you money. Because you can do that first class business, that agent business, any way you want to do it. You can do a billion dollars, it doesn't matter. Because the customer's paying the factory, you get a 10% commission. Victoria's Secret, uh, EV buys $100,000 worth of shoes from China. They pay us 10%, I get $10,000. I don't put up any money, I walk away. It's a nice way to do business. But they are only making 10%. If I buy and acquire the goods, I have to make more. Why? Acquisition. Right. Yeah, I'm putting up money. Right? I mean, if I, if I don't make more than 10%, I might as well put the money in a, in a CD or a bond, or, you know, and, and, and go, go sit on the beach. You know, so there's a lot of a lot of money put up in that, and I got a lot of operations on it, boarding it, going through a process. So we try to make anywhere between 25, 30, 35, 40 percent on that deal when we acquire the goods for that short amount of time. Okay? Any questions? Sure. It's pretty complicated. Okay. Um, so I just move on to a couple of things that I want to talk about. Like, it's, it's tough out here. Okay? No doubt it's tough out here. A guy like me can make it. A guy like me can run a $65 million company. You can too. Okay, I came right out of this school just like you guys. I had a great time here. I got a great education. Uh, you, know, and, you know, you can do the same thing. You can be running a $65 million company. My wife will tell you, nothing's not bad. <laughs> you can definitely, definitely do it. But you've got to start practicing some of these principles now. Not like, oh, you know, I'm out of college and you know now I'm gonna, you know, start, you know, thinking about, you know, how I'm gonna live my life. So I'm just gonna list a couple of principles that work towards a business model, and then a couple of personal principles that I believe that I think will help you in business. And if you practice it now, great. You get in the work environment and you want to be successful, you just got to practice it. Okay? Because you won't be successful. You have to participate in what's going on here. The first business principle is grow from within. Grow from within means that, let's say I'm doing $2 million worth of business with uh, Arrow Costell. And I have an account called BB out on the West Coast, and I have the potential of doing a million dollars in business there. Do I do it? Well, I gotta look at it. First, I gotta say, is my business with Aeropostel maxed out? Can I grow more than Aeropostel? If I'm selling Aeropostel sneakers, maybe I can sell them slippers. If I'm selling them slippers, can I sell them flip flops? Because once you go out, I call it like the rings of Saturn, once you get out to those external rings, it becomes very inefficient. New customers are tough to make money from. There's manuals, there's carton, there's labels, there's social compliance, there's vendor compliance, there's understanding the customer's mentality. What are their quality standards? What are their, what are their requirements? And they're very, very complicated now. EDI systems, computer systems, you've got to linked up to them. To make money that first year is very hard, and it can fail the route. So, you know, I don't want to, like, do two million with Aero Postel and then do a million with the new customer, Phoebe, and then I neglect the Aero Postel and the business goes down to a million, and now I still have the same $3 million business, and then grow. So look at your current customers and say, how do I max that with them? The inner core, that Saturn, that's where you're going to make the money. Can I sell someone a woman's shoe? Hey, can I sell them a kitchen? Because now I know their carton, I know their carton, the corrugated carton thickness. I know where their warehouse is. I know the trucker requirements. I know everything. Can I sell them a kitchen? Can I sell them a handbag? What else make handbags? You know, grow with it. Now, you don't want to be too consolidated in your customer base. And, you know, so 
fish fly out, that that can be dangerous, right? But once you have enough customers, make sure you just grow enough with those customers. That organic growth versus the external growth is very important. Have a plan. Okay, I'm sure you've heard that before, right? I have a lot of employees who get very overwhelmed, especially with email these days. You know, like, you know, you're answering an email, and next thing you know, another email comes in on a different subject and from another customer, and you try to answer that, and then another email comes in from it, an email can be crazy. Two, three, four hundred days, CCs, this and that, it gets nuts. Here's my advice. If you have a lot of things, practice in college, if you have a lot of things, you get overwhelmed, do one thing at a time. Just do one thing at a time. Accomplish, finish that. Don't do like a little bit of this. Oh, I gotta work on this, you know, confirmation sample this case. Oh, one of my production swatches came into this customer. Oh, I'm gonna do 25% of this. If you do 25% of five different tasks, you're gonna be dizzy. Finish one. That came from my mom. That was the story. Finish just one thing at a time. Even in college, it's the same thing, right? It can get, it can get tough here. You get overwhelmed. There's a lot of things going on, right? Do one thing at a time. Now, what if you say to me, well, Paul, uh, my employees will say to me, I did one thing at a time. I listened to you. I'm still overwhelmed. <laughs> I'm still here till 7 o'clock at night. I'm still not getting it all done. I feel like I'm not succeeding in your company. I'll say to them, go to your immediate supervisor and ask, listen, I'm doing one thing at a time. Here's the seven tasks I'm doing. What's the most important for our company? Where are we going to get our ROI from? Anyone want to say what ROI is? Turn on the Excellent. All right. So where is our company going to get our? Your immediate supervisor will do that. That's dead. That's dead wood. Stay away from that. Put that last. So do one thing at a time. And if you're still overwhelmed, go to your immediate supervisor, your boss, or even in my company, come to me and ask. You know, well, that's what a boss is for. That's what a leader is for. Maybe you're a direct academic advisor. Maybe it's a, another student, you know, who's a senior, who's, you know, been through the business before, and knows, you know, and knows the ropes. It's very important to, you know, get out and share. Make your mistakes make you better. Um, I know that's probably common. You've know, probably heard a lot of people, you know, learn from your mistakes, learn from your mistakes, your mother, your father, you know, whatever, you know, learn from your mistakes. I say, Make your mistakes make you better. A lot of people tend to, in business, they tend to like just put fires out. What's the problem? Put a fire out. Oh, where's the next fire? Put that fire out. And it's just, what's the cause of fire? How can we avoid fires from happening again? So, for example, we get in a pre production shoe and we're starting to make shoes, and the pink color, the pink suede, is too, has too much blue in it, and it's wrong. And now we have to ship in 10 days, and what are we going to do? And now we're stuck with all this leather that we can't use, right? I don't own the factories, by the way. I contract the factories. I have a lot of long-term relationships with factories, and I'll talk about that after. Well, the firemen, which is good, but you've got to look at these things like short-term, long-term. Here's your problem. What's the short-term solution? How do we get out of the problem? Okay, let's dye that leather black because you can, you can dye paint black. Because everyone wants black suede, right? You can always use it later, right? Because you can take light to make it darker. And then we can reorder the suede, get it quick, hire an airplane, fly the shoes to our customer, put the fire out. But then we, 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 we never, you know, we don't stop and it takes time. The room is so overwhelmed and so busy. No one ever sits down and goes, how do we get it? Well, it goes back to the critical path. As I was talking about, you're supposed to get a pre-production sample, right? Made out of all production components two weeks, according to the critical path, two to three weeks prior to the ship date. Right? Over the polishing unit. Well, we probably didn't get that pre-production sample on time. And no one followed up and went through it. So it's very important. It's time to see some people. The short-term guys are just like, oh, you're killing me. I got so much to do. Why do I have to have this? Like, can you hear the expression, Monday morning quarterback? You 
know, you gotta like have a have a hindsight meeting. Too many meetings. We have to learn. Because I'm telling you, I don't mind when my people make mistakes. I really don't. But we just can't keep repeating. They have to.